Hello, GitHub Universe. I am Tracy DeLuca. I am founder and design strategist of How Might We Design, which is a design firm focused on global mental health transformation. I'm also the co-host of the Results May Vary podcast, which is a podcast to help you design your life. And I am so honored to be kicking off today's play session and introducing you to some concepts around creativity. We are going to be talking about C squirts, brilliant babies, and our biological imperative to create. So let's begin. Uh, most, most of all, I want to start off with just talking about out of all of the mollusks in the world, my favorite, I'm sure just like yours, is the sea squirt. And that is for three reasons. One is because it's a fun name to say. Two is because, like it na its name implies, it will indeed squirt you in the face if you get too close. And three, I also love it because of what it teaches us about our own human unique quality to be able to create. So when a sea squirt is born, it has a tail and a bit of a brain. And its whole job at that point is to go out into the, the waters and find its safe perch to connect to. And once it does that, it finds a nice rock, a comfortable little home, it will drop its tail and it will consume its own brain matter so that it can use those resources for something more important. And that's because it doesn't have to do anything else for the rest of its life. It just stays on that perch and lets the nutrients sort of wash past it. And it doesn't need to explore or be an adventurer or get out into the world. Meanwhile, the human brain has evolved to have something called a prefrontal cortex, and that occupies more of the brain than in any other animal. So we are physiologically designed to solve problems creatively. The prefrontal cortex allows us to have complex thoughts and to be able to solve problems and make decisions. It also allows us to have our personality expression. So a sense of self-awareness. When you think of who am I, that is all happening from your prefrontal cortex. And then lastly, it's about social behavior. So how do we interact with one another? Those are the things that it, that it helps do. And it's theorized that while the human brain as a whole has tripled in size throughout our 5 million years of evolution, the prefrontal cortex has actually gotten six times larger. So the resources that our brain has, has really prioritized this front part, this creative problem solving aspect. So you could say that you are alive because you are human or because you are creative. You are a human which means that you are creative. Another way to talk about this is looking at babies. So would you be surprised to learn that one out of four babies never learn to walk? Of course you would, because no matter how silly they look or how awkward or how much they fall down, we can look and see that babies are brilliant problem solvers, right? They intuitively know how to learn from failure, how to iterate their way forward, even without knowing the end goal from the beginning. So a baby's not like, hey, I've got to start walking here, right? Like, oh, this tummy time thing is fine for now, but like, really, I got to get up and just start moving. No, there really isn't a goal because they're in a constant state of development. So every day, every hour, every minute, is a new challenge that they're trying to solve or a new skill that they're working to master. They just have this natural curiosity about themselves and their environment. And it's not just these biologically designed baby problem solvers, it's you too. So unlike our friend, the sea squirt, which reaches a certain stage of development and then stops advancing, humans have this seemingly infinite capacity to learn new habits, skills, and capabilities throughout our lifetime. So let's take a pause for a minute and talk about what do we actually mean when we say creativity, right? And that's what I wanna have you get out of this talk. So what is creativity? Why is it a useful muscle to strengthen? Why do we so often resist being creative or putting ourselves out there in that way and how far can it take us? So what are the limits of creativity? And then I also wanna talk about the strategies that our brain uses to create 
as well as to comfort itself, and then how you can use these strategies to advance to your advantage to be even more creative than you already are, because you know you are because you're human. And then what I'm going to ask for you to do is if you could have a pen and a piece of paper or two, or a tablet, or just some sort of writing surface, we're going to do a couple of activities, but I want you to be able to write stuff down. So let's just start with a baseline. What do we mean when we say creativity? So creativity, standard definition, you can just Google it, forming something new and somehow valuable. So having some sense of value that can be an intangible piece like an idea or a joke or a musical composition. It can be something physical like a product or a painting or a book. Right? When we talk about creativity, what we are not talking about is artistic ability. Creativity is not about being artistic. I can't draw, I can't write, I can't sing, and therefore I'm not creative. We hear that a lot. What's more true is that you may not have competently developed the skills to draw or to write or to sing, but you surely are capable of developing those skills. There's something you can learn, something that you can refine over time. You may not become Margaret Atwood or Yo-Yo Ma, but you can reliably improve with practice. And better yet, you can just enjoy an additional way to express your humanity, right? Um, artistic ability includes, oh, sorry. Artistic ability includes skills and talents and things around fine works of art but it is not about how you can solve problems creatively. So it's probably fair to say that most of you in the GitHub universe are developers, although not all of you, but most of us do probably work in the tech industry to some degree. So if you're like most other people, you probably have had some experience with limiting beliefs around not being creative. And yet you stand at the forefront of developing your developers or creating the ways that your fellow human beings interface with technology, which has seemingly limitless possibilities for the future of humankind. So think about that for a minute. Truly, that is an awe-inspiring creative superpower. You influence the future. And I just want you to, to remember that. So we're going to test some of our creative skills and just do a pretty simple exercise. Maybe you've seen it before. It's called 30 circles. And 30 circles, if you have your piece of paper or your tablet, get it out now. If you want to draw 30 circles on the page, they don't have to be perfect circles. Um, if you want to draw triangles, you can do that too, or squares or rhombuses. Um, and then I'm going to give you about a minute, just a quick minute, to draw as many recognizable objects as you can. So an example would be the sun or a smiley face, okay? And just take this time, if you have your circles drawn, even if they're tiny little scribbles, just take this time, about a minute, and draw as many objects as you can, all right? I'll give you this this time to, to go. And don't worry about making it perfect. Don't worry about whether you're artistic. We already talked about that. Just how many different ways can you look at these circles and transform them into something else? Maybe think about ways that you can break the rules. Are there rules? I don't even know. All I said was to do as many objects as you can. So one thing to consider is what rules have you placed upon yourself? And are you actually capable of breaking them? All right, I'm going to give you just about 10 more seconds. 
push yourself to come up with something maybe a little different than what you've already been doing. And I wonder if anybody will actually get to 30. Probably not, it's not that much time. I've kind of boxed you in. All right, so just taking a look at what you've drawn. Yeah, think about like, You've created in a very short period of time with very minimal instruction, you've created something, something new, didn't exist before you started, and also something valuable. And the value in it, in this case, is the ability to communicate your concepts. So maybe you did draw a smiley face or a steering wheel or Saturn, right? All you're trying to do with this is to get your point across to another person around what the object is that you've created. And that is valuable and we do that all the time. And this exercise was pretty easy. We're really good as, as humans at creating solutions to easy problems. All of the easy problems have already been solved for the most part. And so what we're left with are the ones that are more complex. And so we need a way to reliably solve those. And so that's why we want to use creative problem solving processes. So there are a few reasons why. One is so that you can expand your potential solution set. Now this is interesting because oftentimes, you know, we're we're smart human beings. We've gotten really far in life. Um, we are still alive. So we've been able to manage to solve some pretty good problems so far. And we think that because we know things, we know some things that we should be able to know all the things, right? And I love this cartoon because, you know, it says, is this where you lost your wallet? He says, no, I lost it in the park, but this is where the light is. This is where my human experience has given me knowledge about the answer. So my truths about the world are here. And so when I'm presented with a problem, I'm going to go to my own personal truths about the world to look for a solution. And if I don't find a ready-made solution, I'm going to take some of the strategies that I have and I'm going to try and apply them to these problems. And chances are I'm not going to succeed as well as I could because I'm not really open to looking for other potential solutions. And so what we want to do is to expand our potential solution set to broaden that beam of light and to have more creative building blocks or materials that when combined together in different ways can give us new solutions. So we don't wanna be making assumptions and we don't wanna stay as tethered to our own experience. Um, we wanna seek new ways. Another reason why we want to use creativity would be to validate the future before investing in it. A way that we operate often in business world, and I'm sure you've had your experiences with this, is that we'll come up with an idea, we think it's pretty brilliant, and then we work on it and we focus on the details and we just really are trying to refine everything before we, ta-da, present it to the world. And sometimes it falls on his face, right? And we're so confused about why that is. So we want to use a creative process to really give people a way to communicate back to us and provide feedback at all of the stages along the idea creation process, right? So in my work, often we'll create the most scrappy prototypes. So like this one, just, you know, a marker, a, a clothesline pin and some tape and put it in the hands of, in this case, of surgeons to say, would this feel comfortable for you in an operating room? Like, could you imagine holding this in your hand for six hours or 12 hours or however long it's going to take to do the surgery? And they can pretty quickly say yes or no and why. Without that provocation, it's hard for them to really communicate about that. But with something tangible, even like our circle drawings saying, you know, how does this work for you? You know, what would you do differently? Um, what do you wish it included? Those types of questions can really start a dialogue that gives you information that allows you to validate your process all along the way 
without waiting to that big ta-da moment and giving someone a gift that they don't actually want, right? We wanna make sure that our ideas that we're putting out into the world to interact with other people are things that are going to be of value to them. And then the third reason why we might use a creative process would be to weather the comfort, the discomfort of not knowing. So like I said, we love to know things, we're smart individuals. Uh, and so when we don't know something, it can feel very just demoralizing sometimes, right? So we want to use a creative process that gives us some space to really think about the, the challenge at hand and not make those assumptions, not jump to conclusions. So often we can feel threatened or feel like this process is very chaotic. And for people who don't typically engage in creative problem solving processes, it might even look like you're wasting time, right? Like we need the answer today. We don't have time to wait for user research or you know some of the things that you might wanna do to validate the future. We want the answer to the future now. And part of what I do in my work is to remind people that this discomfort is actually great because it reminds you that you are exploring uncharted territory. And for a lot of the very complex problems that we have to solve, like right now, climate change and you know getting distribution of vaccines, the pandemic to billions of people within a short period of time, those challenges are not going to be answered by very simple solutions. Because again, if they were, we would have already used them. We would already use those strategies. And so when we're looking for new solutions, that increases our possibility of success and we wouldn't be working the problem otherwise we would be working the solution if we had the answer to climate change we would be working that solution so we want to have an opportunity to reframe the discomfort that we feel when we're in a creative problem solving process so okay great we understand you know what creativity is uh, we understand why we would use it so why is it then, if we're on board with those concepts, why do we resist so often this idea of a new idea of creativity? Why are we so wedded to our old ways of thinking? And you may have said this, or I'm sure you've heard other people say it. It's like, no, we do things this way here, or we've tried that already and it didn't work, so we went back to the, the way that we've done it. We've always done it this way. Right? Well, okay, that's fine if all you're doing is replicating over and over again. But if you're creating something new, you need to be open to this idea. So how do we think about resistance to creativity? One of the interesting things that I learned recently is that the human brain is in this constant state of flux between two extremes. On one side, you have safety. And then on the other side, you have novelty. And if we think about our sea squirt example, right? At first, that sea squirt was super adventurous. He was out in the ocean and looking for his, you know, his perfect Shangri-La that he was going to stay for the rest of his life. And then once he found it, he sort of retreated back to safety. Uh, and so for us, you know, all of us have a different set point along this continuum. Some of us just are you know, more adventurous, thrill seekers, um, you know, people who jump off of cliffs and you know, have like their little wings and things like those people are on the far side of novelty. And then some people are really about comfort and tradition, homebodies. We have words for these things. Um, one of my favorite examples is thinking about politics. At least in the United States, our language is conservatives and progressives, right? So, either side of that continuum. Now, the truth is we all live somewhere in the middle, but even the way that we think about simple basic concepts in our society sort of maps to this framework. And I've personally found it incredibly useful to think about, you know, where am I on the spectrum today? Because even if I have a set point, I could have an interaction that throws me back to wanting to seek safety, or I could be fairly bored like being shut down during a pandemic and want to seek some novelty. And so how can I, how can I um, 
react to the different states that my brain is in. So if we move towards the novelty side, that's really where we're talking about creativity. So the newness, the openness to new ideas. If we look towards the safety side, what it is about is comfort and feeling that sense of security, right? Like, oh, I just, there was a lion, right? If you think about evolution, there was a lion or a tiger was chasing me. I got back to my my home base, my cave, wherever, and now I'm gonna try and self-soothe. So when we're looking at solving problems in a business context, uh, really, well, it can be a business context or a life concept, really. Um, the goal is discomfort, but not too much. And so again, that's gonna be in a constant state of flux. We wanna reliably find this Goldilocks zone. And so that could look like you really learning and understanding more about yourself. Um, it could look like you really understanding and learning about your team and your team having this language to say, ooh, where are we on this spectrum between novelty and safety? Um, how do we push ourselves or how do we nudge ourselves more towards this novelty if you have a problem that you're trying to solve together? And so, you know, we want to really understand the mechanism that the brain uses for creativity and comfort. And then that's what we're going to be spending the rest of our time on today as we break these concepts down. And before we do that, I really just wonder, just take a moment to think about, you know, how have these concepts, how has this framework come up for you? Maybe even in just the past day or two, are there moments when you've been thinking like, oh, I could see I was needing to feel a sense of safety and I did some sort of retreating or comforting or where you're just getting fed up with being stuck at home or whatever is happening in your life and, and you just needed to add some sort of invigorating aspect to your day. And, and does that really apply to you? I'd be curious to, to know. So, okay, how far can we push creativity? So if we're, you know, we have novelty at the far end of that spectrum, where does that spectrum end? And so I want to do something with you. You know, one of the myths that we have about creativity, another thing that sort of holds us back when we think about it is, oh, creativity is only presenting something that's never been seen before. You know, if, if it, if I've seen it or it's been done before, even if it's been done in a different way, then mm, that's not creativity. It's only, you know, something that we've never done or seen before. So how do we get to that point? How do we make that big leap into the unknown? And so I want to try an exercise with you. This is another drawing exercise. So we are collectively going to come up with the most creative thing that has ever existed in the entire world. Uh, we're going to do it in a few minutes. And what we're going to do is to draw an alien. So when you think about aliens, you might have some preconceived notions about what they look like, right? Because it could be what you've seen in science fiction, maybe the last movie that you saw where it featured an alien, and so you have that on, on your mind. That's not the alien that I want you to draw today, right? Because we've already seen that. And creativity is supposed to be about taking these big leaps into the unknown. So what I'd love for you to do instead is to imagine that we're not on Earth, right? Because Aliens don't live here, or do they? I don't know. Um, we're not, maybe let's not even be in a planet in our solar system. And maybe let's expand beyond the galaxy. And maybe let's even think about if we live in a multiverse, which is a theory, um, maybe we'll be in a totally different universe than we are now. And maybe that universe has completely different laws that affect us. So we're carbon-based life forms, right? So maybe it's a silicon-based life form, or maybe it's a uranium-based life form. I don't know, but let's travel. Why don't we travel to the GitHub universe? Um, let's go there 
And let's imagine what an alien from the GitHub universe could look like. And what are those fundamental laws and differences that exist in that universe? And then what does that make possible, right? Okay. So this, this should be good because we're all so super smart and super creative that we can imagine what these aliens are gonna look like. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to sketch your outcome. And then I would really love it if you wouldn't mind, um, there should be a link where you can take a picture of your alien and then send it back so that I can see all of the amazing creatures that you've created and then I can add it to my own, my own drawing. Okay, so I'm gonna give you, hmm, this shouldn't take too long. I think I'm just gonna give you three minutes. And so maybe I'll lead you through, as you start drawing, kind of just some prompts around what you could be thinking about. And so, yeah, you're in the GitHub universe. Who is there? What sorts of, maybe there's planets, maybe there's not. And traveling through and finding a location where you spot an alien. Oh my goodness. Like you're the first human being to ever come upon this creature. Or is it a creature? I don't know. The laws are different. So what is it? And so really, you know, think about how does it, well, first maybe like figure out what the environment looks like around it. And you can sketch a little bit of that. Put more focus though on the, the actual alien itself, but give a hint of what this world looks like. And think about things like, you know, what, what does it look like, for one? What sort of texture or shape does it take? You can think about, you know, does it have a color or a sheen? Some sort of, yeah, just some sort of um, coating to itself? Maybe, maybe not, right? I'm not. I'm not, uh, I don't want to feed you the answer, but I do want you to think about the different elements. And so it could be thinking about, well, how does it, does it communicate? Is, is there more than one? Is it in community or is it solo? If it is in community, how does it interact? Does it interact like itself? Or maybe it's not in community with that is like itself. How does it interact with things that are dislike itself? You can think about what, what sensory perceptions does it have? Right? So we can see, we can hear, we can feel, we can smell, we can taste. Does this creature have other sensory perceptions? What else? How does it transport itself? How does it get around? Or maybe it doesn't, maybe like the sea squared, it stays in one place. And so if it is mobile, how is it mobilized? And if it's immobile, then what is it doing? And thinking about like, okay, what does a day in the life look like for this creature? What's its main focus or its main goal for, for the day, for today? Does it have emotions? Yeah, does it have an internal monologue like sometimes we do? Yeah, is there a language that it communicates in? Just really thinking about the, not just the form of this alien, but 
the experience that it has, its purpose, its reason for being, again, if there is one. Not having one is also a fine answer. And so just giving you a few minutes to, to finish that up and thinking about what would it want us to know if it could communicate, if it does have a way to do that, what would it want us to know about itself living in this universe, living by these different laws? Yeah, I really am just curious what you guys are coming up with. So please, please take a photo and share it back. Okay, let's wrap that up. You guys have done a great job. Your drawings all look amazing. I cannot see them right now, but I know for sure that they are wildly creative. So I did this exercise when I was a kid. I remember um, sitting down to draw and my, the, the challenge I gave to myself was draw an alien like you've never seen before. And so I thought, I'm just like, oh, my brain, and I'm just like trying to imagine something different, something different. And I, what I ended up drawing, it's like, you know, I put the legs where the arms go. It was basically a human form. And I remember feeling like, no, that I know that this isn't right. This isn't enough. This isn't alien enough. Um, but I really just couldn't get to this place of something I'd never seen before. And then just a few years ago, I went to an exhibit for Stanley Kubrick, who is an amazing filmmaker, and I love his films so much. Clockwork Orange is my favorite of his. And I came upon a quote that he had on the wall when he was this one was talking about 2001 Space Odyssey. And he was saying, you know, there was a story about him and his co-workers. They were all sitting in a room, like these really smart, super creative people, very imaginative. And they were trying to determine what the alien in the movie was going to look like. And they were thinking and thinking, and they have all their, you know, visual inspiration around them and whatnot. And what he said was, it soon became apparent that you can't imagine the unimaginable. And that really just, I mean, it spoke to that little girl who had tried to do that drawing. It's like, oh, it's not possible because I only have the creative building blocks that I have, that I'm aware of, right? That I've experienced in my life. Um, I have no more than that. And that kind of, you know, in one sense, it's like, oh, is that really true? But in the other sense, it kind of lets you off that hook of, well, creativity is only what we've never seen before. It's actually like we can't, we can't get to that state. So there are other strategies for how we do that. And one is really what I'd already said or alluded to, which is that what already is helps us imagine what could be. So the creative building blocks that we have are the things that are going to get us to the new and novel. And so some examples of that, this is a peregrine falcon and, and a stealth bomber, right? And look how just beautifully they look like one another, right? So we can take what we learn from our environment around us and create something new from it. So there's a whole field of study called biomimicry and that field looks at the problem of solving um, problem solving strategies that looks at the natural world. How can we learn from the natural world around us? The you know billions and billions of years that life around us has been evolving and solving these complex challenges through its own evolutionary process. And how can we take those and apply them to our own lives and in our own environments? So this is one way. Another way that we do that is something called, uh, go back one, is called skewmorphs. So this is taking objects that are features that we already are familiar with, um, translating that into something new. So the past 
helps us bridge comfortably into the future. Uh, and so if you look at your phone, I mean, this is an outdated phone, um, but if you look like the YouTube icon looks like a 1950s television. Well, most of us weren't even around in that era. So why is that the chosen image for what's on your phone? And the reason is because that feels comfortable and familiar. So when you're introducing a new concept, you want to have a little bit of that comfort on that comfort spectrum. You want to have a little bit of that so that people feel safe moving towards the new. Um, they can be curious about it and it doesn't feel so dissimilar to the experience that they have that they don't want to engage. And then really thinking about, you know, the myth of the giant leap is actually more about it being tiny, tiny steps over long periods of time. And then we can look back and say, oh, wow, could you imagine, like you couldn't have imagined uh, 12 years ago, you couldn't have imagined what something like the iPhone would inspire, how it's transformed industries, how it's transformed communication, right? Now we can look at that and say, oh, wow, what a giant leap forward that we made. But really, the iPhone was, you know, preceded by the flip phone and other, you know, it's not just about Apple, it's other companies making phones. Um, before that, it was the cordless phone. Before that, it was the corded phone, you know, and go back and back and back. And we can trace those things back. And that's really how we make these giant leaps. They seem like giant leaps, but they're tiny steps over time. And so let's talk a little bit about how the brain creates, because in that are pretty great lessons about how we can then create. So thinking about there are three basic strategies. This was another concept that when I learned this, we're, having worked in the creative field for you know a really long time, finally discovering that there's three basic strategies for how the brain creates was like, oh, I can spend less time trying to figure out how to be creative and more time applying these strategies. And so there's three, they're blend, bend, and break. And I will break them down so that we can have a better understanding of them. So the first one is blend. Blend seems to be the easiest. So if we're thinking about skew morphs, I would start with this slide so that you feel more comfortable before we get to the other topics. So blend is about merging sources. So it's a pharaoh, it's a lion. We put them together, we get a sphinx, right? Pretty easy concept. We've got a man, we've got a fish, we've got Aquaman. Um, you know, we see this all the time. It's a really fun one to play with and to, you know, be an entry point to creativity. I think that if you look at kids, like they do this all the time in their drawings. So it's about melding and combining, splicing and weaving, bringing two things or more together. The next concept is bend. And so bend is really about changing by degrees. And that's why I love to share this. I mean, I love dogs, but I love to share this because you think about, okay, you all started from wolves. And then over time, you know, breeders selected for these various traits. I want a, I want a wolf that's a little more snuggly, you know, that's less bitey. <laughs> um, it's not gonna kill me when I'm around the campfire. And then suddenly we get chihuahuas and dachshunds and bulldogs and all of these things that we have exaggerated certain features over a period of time. So it's about warping or distorting. Um, we can also bend time or we can bend language. Uh, we can exaggerate features, make something really big or really small. And then the third one is break. And this one, you know, in the tech world, like breaking things down into pixels or breaking different sets of code apart. It's pulling the constituent pieces apart, looking at those and then recombining them in different ways. So a fun one that I think about is, you know, we can break up time. So if you ever have seen Rocky or any movie that has a montage, you know, we don't have to 
be with Rocky for the six months that he takes to train. You know, we can just see a couple of clips. Oh, he's drinking a raw egg. He is running next to Mickey's car. He's punching a bag. Now he's in the ring, you know, and he's going to do the fight. We, we catch up with him because we've broken time down and rearranged it into a way that's easier for us to communicate. So fragments and bits and pieces. Um, I feel like I skipped one, did I? We have, oh, okay. There's those three. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, bend, blend, and break. So now I want you to actually get your alien back out and take a look at what you came up with and can you see, I'm really curious, like can you see these different brain strategies incorporated into what you created? So do you have elements that you took one creature from another and put them together, things that you've already you know, been exposed to? Um, were there things that you exaggerated features? So one big giant eye or you know, tiny little feet or hands like a T-Rex. Uh, and then did you break things apart and recombine them in different ways? And maybe you broke things apart from one creature that you know and broke things apart from another creature you knew and then combined those together. So you're breaking and blending. You know, it's not just one, one at a time, it's all of these combined. Then I also want to talk about the flip side of that framework. So how does your brain seek comfort, right? How do we move to the safety side? And this is important because fear can stifle creativity. So again, those spectrum and those endpoints on the spectrum aren't wrong, but if we're seeking new solutions, we want to kind of break out of the fear. So these you're probably more familiar with, the three brain strategies for be dealing with threat, fight, flight, and freeze. And sometimes people talk about fawn or there's other ones, but these are the three we'll focus on. So fight, right? You versus me. I have a better idea. Who's, who's gonna win this competition? Like, I'm smarter than you, I'm gonna take you down. When we're in that mode, we really stifle our ability to be creative because what we're more doing is being dominant over someone or something, right? We're trying to win. We're not trying to push the boundaries of what's new. We may think that our idea does that, but when we're in this adversarial relationship, we can't actually do what we want. So we want to move from you versus me to you plus me. And why that's important, we're building upon each other, right? We're making it about the problem to solve and not about our inner connection. It's it's about bringing together this diversity of thought, this diversity of unique life experiences. So earlier I said, you know, you have your own human truth. Um, the experiences that you've had in your life inform you about the world, but your truth is just as true as the person next to you who might believe totally different um, truths about the world, which I'm not talking about like, you know, whether science is true or not, it's just your experience with the world is the lens through which you see it. So there are facts, um, but there are also human experiences that inform you. So we want to use those unique uh, differences and looking at a problem together to combine those together and see what new things can we come up with? How do we pressure test this idea so that it's more relatable for more people? How do we strengthen it? And you could use the brain creation strategy of blend here. So you take chocolate, you take peanut butter, and they're both amazing on their own. I will argue that they are so, so much better when you combine them together, right? So my perspective plus your perspective plus four other people's perspective about this very complex problem. We all have our own expertise. We all have our unique human experiences. Wow, look how much more robust and complex this solution is. And it can, that's how we solve more complex challenges, right? So, okay, that's fight. Now the next one is flight. So we wanna move from fleeing the scene, like, oh, I feel so uncomfortable here. Like I just have to get out to embracing vulnerability. 
letting your freak flag fly, you know, being your authentic self or crossing into the vulner vulnerability barrier. And why this is important is because we want to be able to have curiosity, right? We wanna be able to have empathy for a situation or for people that have different experiences than us. So in this example, I'm saying that you could use bend, an exaggeration or a warping. And in this example, I was working on a project for rheumatoid arthritis, and none of us on the team had this condition. And we wanted to really understand what does it feel like on just an everyday basis for somebody who has, in, uh, in this case, rheumatoid arthritis really affects the joints. It stiffens them, it makes it hard to move and things like that. So we really wanted to understand what it was like. So we exaggerated uh, our features by wrapping our hands and our wrists and our ankles. And then we just went out into the world and we you know, went and bought some coffee. We walked down the, the promenade to like a marketplace and we tried to interact with the cashier. And what ended up happening was you know, we'll never really truly understand what it's like to live with that disease without having that be our life experience, but we can have a taste of what that feels like. So what it was, was increased pain um, over the course of the day just became so painful to move, which made us irritable, um, which made us slow, which when we were interacting with the cashier and fumbling in our wallets trying to get payment, you know, the, the frustration of that person and then having to, to manage that. So it was a really interesting empathy exercise for us and, and taught us a lot just by, again, like exaggerating the features to have a different experience. And then lastly, fight, flight, freeze, right? Freeze, you go from no way forward. I'm paralyzed. I don't know what to do here. There's no instruction we can move to taking any action. So take a little, a little lesson from the baby, right? Baby is learning to walk. They don't know how to do it. All, you know, they're getting up, they're falling down. All they're doing is just trying anything they can to get to the next level without really thinking about what that next level is. So another way to think about this is those creative building blocks you know, what was in your, your light source in the beginning of the presentation, just juggle what you got, right? Like take different elements and put them together, blend them together and see what happens. Um, or in this case, break, break them down. What, what do I have? What are the elements that I have? How can I break them down? And then how can I recombine them in a new way to get to something novel? So in this example, this is my good friend, Ina. And we were working on a project where we had to create a, a, a short film, but we didn't really start with a script. We started with questions. And then we were using the film as a way to sort of synthesize our information. We tried a couple different strategies. Like one was, you know, going into a Word doc and just trying to write up what the script was but we had so much content we had so many quotes and things from people that we had talked to that it was unwieldy then we tried trello and we tried to put the quotes on different cards but it again it was like we couldn't process this information well enough with the tools that we had so we decided to go totally old school we just printed out all of the quotes and then we broke them down we cut them up into different pieces got this big piece of craft paper and just started like piecing it together and we could very easily swap things around and, and it just made it uh, possible for us to then come up with the script and then put it into you know digital form and have the editor cut the film together. Um, so just different ways that you can use these brain strategies, both from the creativity side, as well as getting a little bit further out of your comfort zone. So, okay, I wanna do a recap because the brain loves to have a recap. <laughs> um, and so, all right, we know your brain is a creativity machine. Never again, please don't ever say that you are not creative. You know that you are physiologically designed 
to be a creative creature on this planet. You already have exactly what you need to be creative. You were born with it. We also know that babies are brilliant, but that you are smarter and you are way more creative than a baby. You can actually stand up for most of the day and be pretty good at walking, you know? So what else are you capable of? What else is possible for you? Then we also wanna remember, when your brain is in a state of fight, flight, or freeze, then all you have to do is blend, bend, and break. And I would love to hear over time kind of how these strategies come to life for you and what that makes possible. Um, I did want to share a few of the resources that I've used um, to create this presentation, as well as just what has informed my own life and my practice of creativity. I feel like I was one of the luckier ones that when I was younger, you know, everybody sort of has a moment where they're taught or told that they aren't creative. Um, some sort of, some, you know, somebody makes a comment that just sort of knocks you off your platform. I was lucky enough that I had some musical skills and some writing skills. So I was sort of given a creativity hall pass, right? A permission slip that then took me on my journey in my career and got me to a place where um, I never had to question, and now I can question whether or not I'm creative enough or you know good enough at my job, but, um, but for the most part, I knew inherently that I was creative. And not everybody has that, so hopefully this presentation has, has done a lot to unlock that for you, but I also just wanted to share some of these resources. So Well-Designed Life is a book by Dr. Kyra Bobinet. Um, she is a neuroscientist, or uh, let's see, she's a brain, she's a brain doctor <laughs> um, turned behavior change expert. And she wrote this amazing book called Well-Designed Life. So I read this after I had had a pretty long career in design and I thought, Ugh, like, I don't wanna read another design book. Like this isn't gonna tell me anything new. But the way that she approaches habit change based on brain science is really transformative. Uh, likewise, Carol Dweck, she um, is the author of, you know, she's the one who's popularized growth mindset uh, versus fixed mindset. And so talking about how growth mindset is realizing, just like this presentation has talked about, that you can learn new skills, habits, and capabilities over time, that you aren't fixed with the brain you have and it's immovable. Um, when I was younger, I used to think, oh, well, I'm just, I don't, I'm bad at learning foreign languages, which is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The reality is, is if I actually did my homework and practiced and did flashcards, I could have gotten good at Italian, but instead I've let it all leave my brain. Uh, Connections is by James Burke. This is actually, um, a, a series, a TV series that talks about when I was talking about all of the different tiny, tiny steps over a long period of time, he tracks that back and tells you the story from like, oh, the plow in a field to, I don't know if this is the true, but to the computer or a perfume atomizer to spritz on your neck to the pistons in a car and how that operates. It's a really fascinating uh, series if you can get your hands on it. And Brene Brown is sort of my, you know, hero of the moment, her book around Dare to Lead and just thinking about how vulnerability and leadership really go hand in hand, um, I think is spectacular. There's also Coactive Leadership, which is a book that I read that looks at the different dimensions of leadership. And so it goes from traditionally, we're like, I'm the leader, I'm the person in front and I'm telling you where we're going and you're coming along with me. It actually talks about, well, there's, there's that kind of leadership, which actually isn't super successful. Like what you wanna do if you're leading from the front is to be bringing people along with you um, as you go forward. You need people enrolled in your vision in order to take them forward. Um, but then there's also leading with another person or leading from behind, which is you're sort of the spot checker for the person who has the vision and you're helping keep them on track. 
um, lots of different um, perspectives on how to lead from more than just the front. Joyful is a book um, from Ingrid Fatelli, who is a fellow IDEO alum. She's done a wonderful talk on a TED Talk, if you want to look that up. But her book on joy and the different aspects of joy, what we find joyful, um, has a lot of science behind it, too. So I was really impressed with that. How to Fly a Horse, uh, Kevin Ashton, is another great book to break down the creativity myths. And again, he's a proponent of these tiny steps forward, not just great leaps. So he demystifies all of the things that we think we know about creativity. And then Runaway Species, this book out of all the books is my favorite and where I got the frameworks for the safety and novelty, uh, as well as the three strategies for how the brain creates the blend, bend and break. It just blew my mind reading this book. So I hope that you guys find these resources helpful. Um, they've been incredibly helpful for me. And then I'll do a little plug of my own creative ambition. Uh, Results May Vary podcast, I think I mentioned it in the beginning, is a podcast to help you design your life. And one of the things that was really interesting to me when I worked at, uh, at IDEO was I realized that I had started to take the skills and tools that I was applying in the business context, it was actually impacting how I approached my life and realizing that I had the potential to design my life in certain ways that, you know, I could, I could blend, bend and break it down and then make new decisions. And what that has made possible for me since I've discovered that concept and started applying it to my life is, is, if I think about who I was as a kid, it would have just blown my mind. So we talked to people like Dr. B.J. Miller, who is a triple amputee as well as a palliative care doctor, and thinking about, you know, how can we use the lessons of death and dying to influence how we live? Uh, we've talked to Sasha Sagan, who is an author and filmmaker, as well as the daughter of astronomer Carl Sagan, who is my other personal hero, as well as Andrean, who she is the producer of the current Cosmo series, and she was um, married to Carl, and they've created so many amazing scientific but engaging stories together. And Sasha wrote this amazing book um, called Small Creatures Such as We, that is also incredibly inspiring. And then Dr. Kyra Bobinet was just on the show. And then Kyra, Katia Verison is um, our new co-host and, and the executive coach. So lots of different uh, inspiration points for creativity. And hopefully you'll, you'll watch or you'll listen to it and enjoy it. But really what I'm most grateful for is you joining me today, engaging in this presentation, hopefully drawing some pretty cool aliens, sending them my way because I'm super curious. And then, yeah, and then I hope for you that creativity no longer feels alien and that you feel really inspired to go out and make the future happen because future doesn't just happen because time goes by. Um, well, it does, but <laughs> we have the capability to influence